Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us tonight um, with the LSAT Unplugged. My name is Ayaka and I'm a consultant with LSAT Unplugged and I'm super, super excited today to have uh, George Mason University Antonin Scalias Law School Assistant Dean for Admissions, Ms. Sabrina Huffman here with me today for an interview. Um, this is really exciting. Um, and before we dig into like all the questions that I always have about admissions and all of that, um, I would like to hand over the mic. So Serena, you can give a intro for yourself um, and how you got in and tell us a little bit of how you got into admissions. Yeah, of course. So first of all, I'm just gonna go ahead and say this, George Mason University Anton Scalia Law School is a mouthful. So moving forward, it'll just be Scalia Law School. Bear with me. Uh, like, you know, that will take a lot of time if I just keep saying all the names. Uh, so one, Sabrina Huffman. I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions and Enrollment Management here at Scalia Law School. Um, I've been at the school for about three and a half years. Um, I started off as a Director of Admissions and then um, was promoted to director of admissions and diversity services. And now I'm the new assistant dean. So I've kind of been in this position um, as an intern since November, but officially since May. Um, I come from being at USC Gould. So I was in LA as an assistant director there. And then I was at Texas Tech Law School as an assistant director previously. And then I was at Wake Forest where I graduated and I was a huge student ambassador. Um, I kind of fell into admissions um, because I talked to the Dean of Admissions at uh, Wake Forest and said, hey, I want to be you. And he was like, I'll show you the way. He really should have laughed at me and been like, no, that's not going to happen. You'll never be me. But he was very nice. And that's just kind of the admissions community. We all kind of know each other. Um, and now I'm here in DC and I love it. Wow. That's a, that's a great journey. And, and I love that you've been kind of across the U.S. and now you're in D.C., so th this is amazing, um, you know, and, and kind of digging right into admissions, um, you know, with the school being in D.C., um, I know there's a lot of connotations that go with that, but I would love to know for prospective students, what kind of student is like the right fit, and is there a right fit for, for the school? Yeah, so um, one thing about Scalia Law School, some people know this, we're actually in Arlington, Virginia. So we're about a mile, and I point this way because this is where DC's at, um, which I'm pointing to my right if you're listening to this on the podcast, um, but we're about a mile away from DC. So we're actually kind of like the best of both worlds. We have some students who really like DC, who kind of like us because we're a smaller school and we're also a little bit cheaper. And then we also have some people who want to just be in Virginia or in the South, but they like us because we're cheaper and we also have all the opportunities of a smaller school. So when we talk about right fit, um, we don't really have one. We have about 66% of our students come from out of state. Only 33% come from in-state. I even try to break that down a little bit more and just kind of classify people of DMV area. In DMV, it's only about 15% of our students come from the DMV. So a lot of our students come in not knowing anyone. So they're really close. They get to kind of know their group. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of areas of interest. So we have about 15. So I never tell anyone like, oh, come to us. If you're only focusing on national security, we cannot do anything else. No, we do a lot of other things. So I always tell people, um, right fit kind of means if you're excited to be at Scalia, um, if you're okay with your students, your classmates wanting to get to know you, um, if you're okay with your professors wanting to get to know you, if you're okay with me wanting to get to know you, because I'll remember who you are and I'll say hi to you. Um, so that's kind of like the right fit, just knowing that you are going to be in a smaller school. Um, that's kind of one of our big things. And then also just knowing that, um, we do really focus on practical experience. So, you know, we're going to encourage you to do that externship. We're going to encourage you to do that clinic. And sometimes that can be a little annoying, but we're only really thinking about you like the best of the heart. Career services really trying to push you through. So not really a right fit, but just more of a, hey, we really want you to be here and we want you to be happy. You know, that's kind of my big thing. I don't want anyone to come here and not be happy with the school. So we really want you to be happy and we're going to make sure you have things to be happy about. We hold a lot of activities. Um, but at the end of the day, if you're like, I hate DC or I don't want to move out to the East Coast, we're probably not the right school for you. 
Perfect. Great, great intro to the school and the student body. That's amazing. Um, just kind of digging more into admissions. Um, I know students, you know, watching this video or listening to this podcast are really interested in, you know, how to get into the school. So, um, and, you know, we all know all the elements that go into an application, but what I would love to know from you is what does it look like from your perspective in looking at an application? Are you reading all of the essays that come in the application? Are you looking at the LSAT first, the, the GPA? What does that entail for you? Yeah, of course. So we start off with the CAS report, which LSAC produces, which has the um, LSAT, GPA, and then also the letter of recommendations and the writing sample. That's the first thing we always read. And I don't know why, but that's that's how we do it here. Um, and then we move on to the EAP, which is the application at full length. We read the personal statement, but we really do pay attention to the Mason statement, which is a required statement that um, is a way for students just to explain why Mason, why Scalia Law School, what made you interested in us. And then we move down to the resume and all the other statements. So I would probably say, if you're looking at which one is more important or like what is your big gaps, Obviously, LSAT and GPA, everyone's going to tell you that's important, but we're used to having, you know, some non-traditional students where the GPA is going to be a little lower. We're used to having some students who um, maybe just are splitters, you know, something happened where they, they don't test well or, you know, their GPA just doesn't hold up to their LSAT. So it, that's not going to stop us from reading everything. We read every single application that comes through start to finish. Um, but we do really, really do focus on the Mason statement and the resume. That's going to help you kind of stand out to all of our other applicants. I, I would love to double click into the what you call the Mason statement, which is, you know, the required piece. Um, part of the required pieces. Um, and in that, I know there's some, there's areas of study that are strengths of the Scalia Law School. Um, and should people tie or kind of not fudge, but force that statement into one of those strength areas or areas that applicants might perceive as like they need to hook it onto one of those things? Yeah, no. Great question. Um, I have read a personal sta amazing statement. The student's gonna kill me. I will actually tell you about two of them from our entering class. <laughs> One of them met me at a law fair and she saw my lipstick and was like, I love your lipstick. And then she started talking to me and she liked my personality. And then all of a sudden she was like, hey, this school's actually two hours away. Let me look into it. So her amazing statement saying, hey, I actually applied to the school because of Sabrina. Um, and then when she started telling me about the school and the environment, then all of a sudden I was like, hey, this is kind of, I can see myself going here. And then when she came here, she went on the tour, she saw what I was preaching and she was like, sign me up. Uh, the other person said that they met me on the road and I told them about, um, <laughs> that we're like a mile away from Chick-fil-A and that piqued their interest because they thought Chick-fil-A was not in the DC or the Northeast which we all know there is now Chick-fil-A, but you know, it's fine. Um, so that was their racist statement, but it actually showed that they did some research or they at least talked to us. So no, you shouldn't force it. But I do think we offer a lot of areas of interest. We have a lot of clinics. We have a lot of different professors that even if it's, hey, I didn't hear about your school until you all sent me an email. And then I clicked on the email. I liked what you said. So now I went on your website and I think I'm actually could be interested in Jamil Joffer national security or Josh Wright antitrust like these are classes or these are people who sound interesting to me and I might want to take that class that at least shows us that you did some research um the nose of the Mason statement is one there's a lot of different law schools in DC that might have the same first name as us um don't don't call us them we're George Mason <laughs> we're Scalia Law School um also you know we are DC area but we are in Arlington so if you're like hey I really want to be right next to the Capitol it kind of seems like you didn't do the research um also kind of telling us like hey I just applied to your school because you sent me an email if it's only three sentences for a Mason statement it's just going to show that you might not be as interested um and we might start sitting there being like well why would we accept you over somebody who's at least did some research. So don't mm -hmm. force it, but you know, you can be really honest about it and say like, mm -hmm. I didn't hear about your school until the other day. 
great. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm also like, I also, when I was back in the day, when I was applying mm-hmm. to schools, I didn't hear about the school until way later. So I, I kind of feel for people who are like, I didn't know about it. Mm-hmm. I didn't know about it either until I started doing research. Well, that's great that you kind of honor honesty in that. So that that's wonderful. And I, you mentioned a little bit um, about non-traditional students and we get a lot of questions from, you know, the LSAT employed listeners about, you know, how does admissions view non-traditional students? Yeah, so we love non-traditional students. So a couple of things about our part-time students. So we actually have part-time students and then full-time. Because we have part-time, we're used to a lot of non-traditional students because a lot of people who are working full-time are usually non-traditional. And then we also have students who maybe are retiring from the military or on their second career or maybe on their third career or whatever the case may be, who are coming in full-time. So we're used to seeing these applicants. You know, being in DC, it's kind of easy for us to see those applicants because not a lot of people, um, if you're non-traditional, you're not, you might not want to move. You know, you might have a family, you might have kids, you might have like a life that you're like, am I really going to move across country for a law school? So we do see a lot of these applicants. Um, I, I'm a little younger. I'm not going to tell you how young, but, um, some people have told me great inflation is a thing. So we always look and say like, Hey, just because your GPA is a little lower or just even lower does not mean that you are not capable. You know, at the end of the day, we're really trying to find applicants who we think can do successful here at Scalia Law School and also just go out past the bar and become employed. Because at the end of the day, that's what everyone wants to go to law school for. They want to come to law school, be successful, pass the bar and be employed. So that's what we're kind of looking at. The great thing about non-traditional applicants is they have a resume. They actually have that professional experience. And that is going to be a way for our career services to actually make them stand out. You know, a lot of firms are wanting somebody that actually has a resume that includes professional experience outside of the academic experience. So we look at the GPA, we look at the LSAT, but we're actually looking a little bit more on the resume side to see, hey, what have you done? What what kind of skills, transferable skills can you bring in? You know, do we think you could be marketable? Do you think you could help us? Do you think you could do the work? Yeah. And surprisingly, a lot of non-traditional students, not even surprisingly, I don't even know why I said surprisingly, a lot of our non-traditional students can do the work. They've proven it by their resume. You know, like they've been in jobs for six years. They're committed to something. And at the end of the day, that's what we're looking for. So, you know, GPA and LSAT is not going to deter them from being accepted. Um, and we're expecting most likely the GPA to be a little lower. Yeah. And, you know, you kind of touch on it with the resume and we get this question a lot. And and I know this gets into the nitty gritty of an application, but um, with those non-traditional students, sometimes their resume is super long. Um, even if they're in the workforce for a couple of years, that resume can get really long really quickly. Um, and so what things are you looking for in a resume? Is it accomplishments? Is it, you know, maybe employee um, affinity group participation or, you know, diversity participation? What are you looking for in that resume? Yeah, so for non-traditional, you can put everything. So we have a lot of military students and they move around a lot. You know, they will list everything. So it all of a sudden becomes a two-pager, even though they're just listing that U.S army or us like navy but all their positions underneath so list all your jobs i probably would say depending on your job if you're going back to like undergrad you could probably cut it um we love seeing community involvement so we do see a lot of non-traditional students who have community involvement that could be ptos for their kids um ptsa ptsa uh for their kids um (laughs) elementary, we could see the church volunteer. Some of them are coaches, you know, like basketball coach for their kids or just community basketball coach. We love seeing that. We do love seeing employee awards. We do love seeing certification. So if you know your IT, you probably have a lot of different uh, certificates or you probably took a lot of classes just to keep your skills new. We love seeing that. Um, I would definitely say more is better when it comes to a non-traditional student when it comes to a resume. I'm never going to sit there and say, why do they list something from 15 years ago, especially if 15 years ago, they were still out of undergrad. Mm -hmm. Great. And for those non-traditional students who have gaps in their resume for any reason, um, including parenting, um, is that okay to include in the resume or is that something that you would rather see in an addenda? I would highly recommend them putting it in the resume. Um, And that way, just in case, you know, 
if you have your resume and then we have the diversity statement and then we have all these other statements that you can apply and then your addenda is the last because for us the addenda is last mm -hmm. the person might not realize the gap they might have already put the note in like gap in employment and mm -hmm. they might not think to go back to be like oh wait is this the gap she's talking about or is this the gap he's talking about? So I would definitely say, go ahead and put that in there. No one's going to sit there and be like, oh, why did she put it in there? You're filling in the blanks. My number one thing I tell students is don't let the admissions committee fill in the blanks for you. Fill in the blanks for them. Great. Yeah, that's great advice. And that kind of leads me into, um, you know, we are, we as a country, as a world, we've experienced the pandemic and there are, you know, students who are graduating out of undergrad right now who might have a change in their GPA because they switched classes to pass, pass fail um, in the spring or fall of last year. Um, there may be people who have gaps in their employment. How imperative is it to kind of explain that in, within the application? Yeah, so um, the admissions committee consists of people who uh, are a little younger millennials like myself and some people who may be classified as boomers or, you know, the gen, the, the generation ahead of me. Um, so I definitely tell people, go ahead and explain everything because you don't know who's reading your application and you don't know what they're thinking of that day. You know, we're still in the pandemic right now, and, but you never know how March is gonna look. You never know how April is gonna look. So you don't want them to forget about the pandemic. Not saying anyone could forget about it, but it might not be the number one thing on their mind the day that they're reading your application. So I would say, go ahead and explain it in an agenda, or if you can put it in your resume or even your Mason statement or any Anywhere, just go ahead and highlight that for us. So we're not sitting there being like, well, do you think they switched to completely online and that's the reason why their grades shrunk? Or do you just think it's pass fail and they just like checked out? Like you never know. I could come up with a thousand different scenarios of reasons why maybe the GPA dipped or there was a gap in employment. But I would rather not come up with those scenarios. I would rather just the applicant to tell me what it was and me be like, okay, great. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to give the information to admission. Yes. You know, um, I don't, I have never clocked the amount of time I read on an application, mm -hmm. but if I'm sitting there having to ponder why I think you were unemployed or your grades dipped, that's not going to be my favorite thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, there's so much information out there on the internet. And, and I always say, you know, you're, students are always kind of eager to apply to, you know, the top 14 schools out there. And, and there's so much information about that, but um, I, I've had a little bit of a career. Um, so I'm a little bit more selective of what I'm looking for in a school. And so I think the research is as important as actually applying. Um, and when students do research about the Scalia Law School, I guess um, I'm, I would love to hear from you. What are, what are the good places to, to hear about, to learn about the school. I know that you have your website, there's LSAC, there's Reddit, there's other forums out there. What do you recommend? Yeah, so I definitely recommend our website. And I know that's just very standard, but I also recommend going on our website and scheduling a phone call with an admissions worker or a student ambassador, because I do, uh, to be honest, I know what people think about us. Scalia Law School, they automatically put us as a very conservative school, mm -hmm. but you're going to talk to people who are going to be like, no, it might be a little bit more conservative than a lot of law schools, but it's because a lot of law schools um, are a little bit more liberal. So it's more of like a me medium here. You know, when we pull, we pulled our students before, um, some of our professors have just for their research, and we usually come out 50-50 or maybe, you know, 60 liberal, 40 conservative. So like we're actually pretty even. So I always say Reddit, be a little bit more cautious about it because, you know, people are automatically just going to assume the worst because that's what's out there about us. And I would hate for someone to just automatically disclude us, even though they don't know what we're offering. So go beyond our name, um, talk to people. You know, I will give you student ambassadors names, but I also use non-student ambassadors as in people who are not working in my office to talk to students. You know, I'm not gonna just say, oh, you can only talk to these 10 students. No, tell me what you're interested in. If you're interested in a student org, I'm gonna talk to the president, you're gonna talk to that president. You're interested in a journal or clerkships, I'm gonna find you somebody who's in a clerkship or in a journal, and I'm gonna pair you that way. It's not always gonna be a student ambassador, so it's not always gonna be someone who has kind of like the script that some people think we use in admissions. That's great to know. And, and, you know, I've, I've looked around on the website. I can spend 
a good amount of time in there <laughs> looking up stuff. So I, I think it's, you know, a great advice to go, go and look. Um, last thing about the application process, has anything changed? And I know things can still be changing due to the pandemic. Um, anything in the process, um, how you interact with prospective students, anything of that sort? Yeah, so um, this year, I would definitely say it's not the application process, but it's kind of just getting to know us. We do, we did open up tours, but we're not offering up classes, which is a little different. We used to have prospective students sit in in classes. That's just not the case. Um, contract tracing, we can't have students coming in. Um, we are having tours, but the tour sizes are limited. So that's a little different. Um, when it comes to the actual application, nothing's changed you know we've been um extremely lucky to kind of have this continuous spot on campus um unlike some schools we actually had 1l classes fall 2020 and spring 2021 they were on campus so that means a lot of us were on campus still um so for us even though we're all back full time and that started about a month ago we've kind of been around for the last year and a half so we've kind of just been not used to it so nothing has changed because of the pandemic but um, yeah, that thing, I know that's kind of a boring answer, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, good, and you know, I, I think some of the good things that came out of the pandemic where people got used to, you know, Zoom um, or, you know, kind of talking yeah. on the road, <laughs> so. Exactly, um, we switched over, we were really lucky. Um, we switched over all of our admitted student open houses within the first three days of our campus closing. Wow. Um, so wow. we started doing a bunch of admitted student events in March 2020 rather quickly, and then we kind of perfected it. So we've taken some of our personal touches and we liked them a lot, even though we were having admitted students come on campus um, last year. So fall 2020 and spring 2021, we had admitted students come on campus. We still held our virtual events because we got a lot of feedback from them. People loved them. We realized, hey, you can have a virtual event at 9 a.m. People will attend. You can have it at 9 p.m. People will attend. You know, it might be a smaller group, but we liked actually the intimacy. So some of our virtual events, you might be meeting with a professor. We only expect like 10 people to meet because we expect only the 10 people who are interested in that area to right. attend. And that actually makes it a really interesting conversation because you're coming with an interest. You know, you can, maybe you read their article. Sometimes we'd provide what this professor was working on scholarship wise. So that way you can kind of question them. Uh, or you can come kind of with just, hey, tell me more about your area. Amazing. That's, that's awesome. Um, kind of switching gears to life as a student at the Scalia Law School, which is Kind of my favorite part um but uh, you know what can students expect in that first year um i know there's a set of classes that are required but what's the expectation there student body expectation so um i don't think this is a surprise to anyone but we are actually one of the schools that increased our 1l sizes this year shocker i feel like everyone increased their 1l sizes but one thing that we did is we actually added another section because we really do care about keeping our sections rather low in enrollment. So we have about 50 students in this section. Usually it's anywhere between 40 to 65. So, you know, we saw what was happening and we were like, we need to add a section. So no matter what, you're going to see that you're gonna be in a smaller classroom. Most, some of the time, some of our students, their largest class is their 1L class the whole entire time in Scalia Law because we do like to keep our classes rather small. Um, something that you'll see that's a little different than uh, other schools is we require economics for lawyers, which is Econ 101 and the fall semester of your 1L year. Um, every Scalia Law student has to take it. So it's kind of like, you know, your ritual, it's stepping in. Um, some students hate it. And I would say some, a lot. Um, others, you know, they're econ majors, so they love it. They're PhDs in econ. But at the end of the day, um, I would say most people think it's going to be a lot harder than it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can kind of just work your way through it. Um, students actually, you know, they hate it when they're taking it, but once they're done with it, they see why it benefits them. Mm -hmm. They really like that they can kind of step back and evaluate a case on a different level. Um, so that's a little different for us. 
we also have a lot of professors who specialize in P uh, econ. So we have a lot of professors who are PhDs in economics. So you'll understand that, you know, you might be learning the same torts case, like the 1L torts case standard one, but they might emphasize how that ruling affected the economy or how it could have affected the economy if it would have went this way or whatever. You're learning the same thing. They just might like talk a little bit more about econ. So that's always a little interesting for our students. Outside of that, there's so many different areas you can go into. There's so many different organizations, centers. We have a lot of centers here that like your experience is going to be different. It depends on what you're interested in. Uh, we have students who are really active in SBA. They're an active in basically every single organization. They're student ambassadors. They're Mason mentors. They're all of them. And then we have others who are really just hey, I'm here to go to school. I have a family at home. I like my classmates, but I want to come in and come out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the reason why we have the Flex JD program, which is our new part-time program. We've always had a part-time program, but the Flex JD allows it for the first two years. Um, so one L year, two L year, part-time students, you're only um, required to be on campus two nights a week. So you'll be taking two nights virtually, which is really nice for the part-time students. That's amazing. And I love that flexibility on that flex um, schedule. So that's amazing as well to be inclusive of all types of students. I know you mentioned this a little bit earlier about, you know, how students kind of get to know you um, as a student and kind of come together as a student body. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about that student body culture, um, yeah. is it a more collaborative culture? You hear kind of horror stories about law school. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I kind of uh, mentioned it before. A lot of our students don't know people here. They might know a friend of a friend or even a friend in DC, but not a lot of them are like, I have a group of friends in DC. I don't want to know you. So nine mm -hmm. times out of 10, your best friend is going to be someone in the law school. Um, because of that, it would just be kind of awkward if you're super competitive because you're hanging out with these people a lot. Um, so all very collaborative. You know, we really encourage it. We actually host a uh, one L class before one L starts. It's kind of like a summer fun class. And we tell people in the syllabus, like, hey, if you're absent, you should share your notes. Like, this is what we encourage at the law school. Like, you should be used to sharing your notes. You should ask your classmates to share their notes because this is what we want. Like, go ahead and get buy into this culture. Uh, we do a lot of activities to kind of buy into it. You know, we have a welcome back bash. Um, it's annual every single year. It allows students to kind of get to know each other. Um, so a lot of activities in-house. Also, a lot of our students live less than a mile from school. Um, probably most of them live 0.5 miles from school. So they're all going to the same Trader Joe's. They're all going to the same Whole Foods. They're all going to the same Giants. It's just, it's really hard to be competitive with people you run into all the time. Um, and then because we offer so many different um, areas of focus, so many different clinic opportunities, you'll realize a lot of your classmates aren't interested in the same thing as you are. You know, like not everyone's gonna be interested in immigration law. Not everyone's gonna be interested in business law. Like that's just not the culture here. Um, so definitely come here, um, very friendly vibes. And you know, most of these people are gonna be like your best friends. Um, I've met alums who were in each other's weddings who are still friends to this day and they've been out 10, 15 years out. Wow, that's, that's a pretty tight knit group. So it's amazing to see that in, you know, law school. Um, you mentioned it a little bit, um, but for students who are like, I really want to be prepared for my first year, I'm going in. Um, and you mentioned the summer program or summer class. Can you kind of give us a little bit more details on that? Yeah, so it's a summer class. It's always offered at like the end of July, usually for two weeks. Sometimes it's only one week and it's from six to nine. So it's like law 101. So you're going to learn like the court system. You're going to read some cases. And then the great thing about it, the last couple of years, we've actually had different professors teach each night and our dean, Dean Randall, taught a night too. So that was really exciting. And it's just kind of a way for you to be introduced to law school before law school. Um. So that's number one. That's like jumping on it. We never tell people to read books or any of that. That's not our advice. But maybe you couldn't take that pre-law, like that summer class. Maybe, you know, you were on vacation or you were just busy or you hadn't been admitted yet. We actually, during our orientation, offer legal methods, which is a class that meets three times and it's like a two hour class. And that's also just intro to law. So you're kind of learning about the legal system before you actually step in 
to your first day of classes, which our students really enjoy. We get really good feedback on that class and just also our summer class too. It's amazing. Like being prepared before, before your first year. That's great. And, and I love that the different professors are teaching each night. So, it, you know, it's not just first day of school, you're meeting all your professors. It's exactly. kind of yeah, and um, during orientation, we also have a 1L professor panel. So we'll put the 1L professors together and the students can ask them questions. Wow. And depending on um, who's teaching what class, sometimes you're actually with two sections. So your professor is never going to know you, remember <laughs> you from that class. So it's really nice because you can kind of like submit questions anonymously. Wow, that, that's so cool. And, and that's amazing to get that like, not one in one, but a very close relationship with not just your peers, but your professors. And that's yes, nice. exactly. Yeah. Um, and I know we talked about it a little bit um, here and there, but just interesting areas of study available at the school. Um, you know, I, I know you mentioned immigration, e econ, um, yeah. I'm sure. And you said 15 other areas. Exactly. I'm like, the list goes on. So um, we have a really strong intellectual property um, that is um, housed with our Center for Intellectual Property and Innovation, and innovation would be startup companies. So that's intellectual property and also startups, big thing. Um, national security, kind of what we're known for, antitrust. We actually have an antitrust week for on-campus interviews. So employers will send their firm here one week for just general, and then they'll come back another week just for antitrust. So kind of what we're known for. Um, we also have, you know, um, immigration, we mentioned that, uh, we have, um, started up starting in spring 2022, sorry, Woo. uh, we have started up a federal Indian law clinic. So we're focusing on, uh, federal Indian law, tribal, um, law. So that's hopefully popping off too. So we have those classes. We have students who are interested in public interest, that so we have a public interest in advocacy concentration. We also have free speech clinic, which um, kind of falls into that too. Uh, we have a Supreme Court clinic. So, you know, if you're clerkship, that's kind of a really popular area. We place really well with it comes to clerks. We actually had a recent alum who graduated two years ago, who's now being a clerk for a Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court justice. So that's kind of a big deal. Um, administrative law also, I could just go on, it's a lot. Uh, so I will keep it short. So um, basically 15 areas. And if we don't have it, we're always thinking of ways to bring in adjunct professors to teach the students who might be interested in that area. Amazing. And, and I love that there's, you know, clinics that go along with it and, and alums and, and the network there. That sounds amazing. Um, and, and speaking of clinics, you know, clinics, externships, other opportunities um, outside of the school. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how students can get involved? Um, I know there are students out there who want to get involved day one. Some yeah. students might not, you know, how, how can we get involved? Yeah, exactly. So um, one good thing about our law school is I kind of bringed on it before we have a lot of centers and centers are a you know research hub and that's a way for one else to kind of get involved you know fall semester focus on your classes yeah. do not do anything outside of classes and some student orgs but during your spring semester those centers can actually hire you as research assistants and that way you're already working with professors one-on-one -on -one. you know you're researching you're also getting paid for it so that's always really great and then after your 1L year, that's when you can start doing, you know, externships, clinics, all of that. A great thing about Scalia Law School is even though we are rather small, we have actually established a lot of new clinics in the last couple of years. So I mentioned the federal law, Indian law clinic. We established the immigration law clinic. We established a poverty law. Um, and then we also established the innovation law clinic. So the last, oh, and free speech. So the last four years, we've established five new clinics. So we're always establishing new clinics. So that's always a great opportunity for our students to kind of get more opportunities to be involved. Um, externships, you know, we're so close to DC. We're in Virginia, but we're also close to Maryland too. So some of our students do public interest externships in Maryland with the counties there with like the public defender's office. We also have a bankruptcy court externship that students enjoy. And then we also have the Hill, the Capitol Hill externship where you're actually working on Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, so those are kind of ways to get involved. Other times, sometimes our students take that externship 
And that leads into maybe like a semi-permanent or temporary job that might last three to four months. So they actually switch to part-time so they can work full-time and get that full-time work experience. And then the next semester, they switch right back to full-time. Oh, wow. Okay. So there, there's a little bit of flexibility in that schedule, which is yes. amazing. Um, and, and I'm like, I'm so interested in all of these. I want to <laughs> talk about it all, but it's <laughs> time. (laughs) Exactly. I'm like, I I told you, I can talk a lot and we have a lot to talk about. So, but yeah, there is flexibility to switch full-time to part-time, part-time to full-time. And a lot of our students do that. That's amazing. Um, and and I know this full-time to part-time, I know you, you talked about a flex. I know there's a, um, an all online LLM program as well. Can you kind of just give us a general overview about what kind of degree programs there are? And I know there's a lot, so we don't need to come yeah. over it, but. <laughs> yep. So we have our standard JD program. The JD will have a flex JD and full-time JD, which technically there's also a part-time JD because the flex JD is like new. So mm-hmm. some students are like in a part part-time JD program, but at the end of the day, it's JD and just depending on your credits is where you fall. Then we have a Juris Master's program which is residential and also online. And that's gonna be like a master's of science and law. So, you know, like maybe you're in a career, maybe HR or a police officer or government. You know, we have some people who work for the FBI who are in our Juris Master's program. We have some journalists who write a lot about legal items who are in our Juris Master's. So it's kind of, hey, I don't want a JD, but I kind of want to understand the law. Mm -hmm. Those people go into that program. Then we have our residential LLM program. That includes antitrust, U.S. law, that includes national, like SIN, so cyber, national security, it's, and then intellectual property. And then we have our online program, which is LLM, and that includes U.S. law and antitrust. And then we just established two days ago the Flex LM. And the Flex LLM allows students to take advantage of the DC bars new ruling where it says, hey, as long as you have these 26 credits and these courses and you're a foreign educated attorney and it comes from an ABA school, you can sit for the DC bar. So we now have the Flex LLM just established two days ago. It's on our website, link, picture, everything involved. And that's also a new program. So a lot of new programs here. Um. You know, our school is growing, but also with a new dean, Dean Randall, he's uh, named one of the uh, last decade's transformative deans. He comes from I-Law, so, you know, he's clearly, you know, thinking of these creative ideas, thinking ways to be innovative and, you know, kind of change the legal field. That's amazing. And, and, you know, I took a look at your website right before this and and I was like, what is this? I don't know. And, you know, so this great explanation of um, the new offerings that are happening. This is amazing. And and I think being innovative in that, that's that's great. Um, Kind of bringing it full circle. um, I would love to hear, you know, what is your, it doesn't have to be one thing, but what is your favorite thing about the Scalia Law School? I know there must be many, but Oh gosh, this is a question because there's so many. Um, one, I really do like the people here. I think at the end of the day, our students are amazing. They love being here. They're super creative, though they sometimes challenge um, each other. I think it's a good way, you know, like we encourage that debate. And that's kind of one thing that I love about our school, you know maybe you disagree with your professor and maybe you disagree with the student. It's not going to say, hey, don't speak your opinion. It's going to say, okay, argue your opinion. Let's go. Let's bring the cases together. Let's hear both sides. Let's have this, you know, very um, active dialogue. You know, at the end of the day, we all want to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, also all of your staff, the faculty, they're going to get to know you, which is also nice. Um, I see students who come in from 1L year, I see them 3L year, I see them at Trader Joe's with their families and I'm like, oh, hey, it's me. Like, don't know if you forgot me and they don't. So I think it's really nice that you're gonna have that support system. And you're also gonna have people who are just kind of open to your opinions. Um, So that's one thing I really like about the school. I also could just kind of name that I do love that sometimes we do cornhole tournaments. Uh, Sometimes, you know, we have a casino night for our students, but that's, that's neither here or there. If it's just really about the Scalia law, it's that you're going to be supported with a tight knit community. And then we're always willing to try new things. 
you know, we establish all those clinics, uh, we're establishing all these new programs. You're never going to hear us say, no, we've never done that before. It's going to be like, no, we'll try it. If I may double click into that a little bit, or is that kind of push forward for um, establishing new clinics or um, stuff like that? Is that usually student led, faculty led, both together? How does that work? Both together. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I actually heard a story from um, the director of our Center for uh, Law and Liberty. He said that he talked to our former dean and was just like, hey, we should, we should tap in this. And then like a week later, our former dean was like, you're the new executive director of the center. And he's like, wait, what? Like I did, this was just one of my ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have some students who are like, no, I really want this. You know, mm -hmm. they'll send emails to our dean. They'll talk to the other deans. And all of a sudden we're like, this is a great idea. We should support this. Uh, we have alums or friends of the community that are like, hey, we want you to try this. Here's some money. Here's our support. We will support you. We will teach these classes for you to get this out. So it really depends on what it is. But at the end of the day, Dean Randall, um, he loves talking to our current students. Uh, he actually, he, he's known to give out his cell phone numbers uh, to all of our current students. It's actually his cell phone number as a lot of people try it out. They're like, is this really you? And he's like, it is. <laughs> um, he's really here just to listen. And because of that, you know, he's so open and willing to learn that and like listen and kind of do new things that staff faculty trickles down. No one's gonna sit there and be like, oh no, 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 we shouldn't try that. Um, I always tell people just in missions world, I'm never going to tell someone like, we shouldn't do this idea for recruiting because that's just not who we are. It's really a law. We're gonna just try it once. That's, that's amazing. And I love that culture of being open and kind of putting ideas out there and kind of trying things out. That's amazing. And, and that's a hard culture to cultivate. So yes. it's amazing that it's coming from top down. Um, well, this has been a very, very informative conversation. I, you know, you bring such a bright energy and I, I love this. Um, I, if students who are looking or, you know, interested or listen to this podcast and want more information about the Scalia Law School, um, can they reach out to you? And if they can, how can they reach out to you or admissions? Yeah, so um, I would definitely say they could definitely reach out to me. I always tell students to reach out to Law Admit. So it's L-A-W-A-D-M-I-T at G-M-U dot E-D-U. So L-A-W-A-D-M-I-T at G-M-U dot E-D-U. That's going to be your best bet because that way we can filter you through everyone. So maybe you have a question about me. Maybe I said something. You're like, hey, I want to connect to you. I want to talk to Dean Huffman. They're going, to train, they're going to forward that email. But maybe you're like, hey, I want to learn more about the Juris Master's program. They're going to forward it to the right per person. So we usually try to get everything in a law admit. Um, our assistant directors answer that. Our admissions coordinator, I sometimes go in and answer those emails. So it really is like an all hands on deck. Uh, but that way you're not lost in an inbox. Or, and I don't want to say lost in an inbox, but you're getting directed to exactly who you want to talk to. Um, okay. Our graduate admissions program, uh, Brian Benison, he's the director of admissions. He loves talking to students. So I'd hate for you to like send me an email. I answer it and he's like, oh no, wait, Sabrina, we could have elaborated a little bit more. We could have told them about blank, blank, blank. And I'd have been like, oh, dang it. So definitely law admit at gmu.edu. We also do a lot of virtual, we're having virtual events. We have prospective students on campus. So you can meet us that way or you can schedule a phone call. Great. And, and for those students who, you know, may want to tour, but can't travel um, due to any sort of restrictions out there, um, is a phone call the best or virtual tours? Is that something that you guys are doing? Yeah. So we actually do live virtual tours where you can actually ask us questions while we're walking around and we'll actually answer your question on camera. <laughs> um, and it's one of the we did it for admitted students this summer and everyone loved it. It started in March, um, but we got really great feedback on it. And I don't want to give away our secrets, but <laughs> if you can't, can't come out here, definitely schedule a virtual tour. You won't regret it. It is one of my favorite things that I invented. It's, I know virtual tours aren't new, but the way we do it, it's a little unique. Um, and I promise you, you're going to get a lot of information in those. Oh, okay. So I am excited to see one of those. Um, well, thank you so much for all of this great information. It has been a pleasure talking to you. Um, and we will leave links um, to reach out to admissions um, 
in the description box um, of the video. So please check it out and also check out the website. There's a lot of good information there. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sabrina. This has been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. And as I told you all, please feel free to reach out to us. We're also will be on the road recruiting. So if you see me, please come say hi. I love talking to students. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.